Naming benzene is going to be the topic in this first lesson in a whole chapter on aromatic compounds. In fact, this is actually going to be two successive chapters on aromatic compounds. There's just enough material there uh, that most undergraduate textbooks split it up into two chapters, and I will do the same. Uh, in this first one, we will name benzenes. We'll talk about properties of benzenes and some conceptual understanding associated with them, and we'll identify aromatic compounds. Uh, and then in the second chapter, we'll go through and talk about all the reactions of aromatic compounds. Now, uh, in this lesson, we're going to be naming benzenes. We'll name monosubstituted benzenes and disubstituted benzenes and even more substituted polysubstituted benzenes. We'll talk about benzenes with special names. We will cover everything you are likely to encounter in your undergraduate class. All right, so just real quick, this little six-membered ring here, uh, with looks like it has alternating single and double bonds, is benzene. It actually doesn't have alternating single and double bonds. There's actually delocalized electrons all the way around. This is one of the resonant structures. So just one thing to keep in mind. So uh, we'll start with naming monosubstituted benzenes when you have a substituent coming off there. And it'd be very reminiscent to what we saw with cyclohexanes uh, and substituents coming off. So uh, when you name a monosubstituted benzene ring here, so uh, your substituent, there's only one, has to be at carbon one. That will actually define where carbon one is on your benzene uh, with six carbons total. And because it's the only substituent and it has to be at carbon one, it is not included in the name. And so in this case, instead of saying one bromo and then benzene as the parent chain, we're just going to say bromobenzene. Cool. There we go. Same thing over here. Now, in, instead of having a bromo as our substituent, we now have an ethyl group as a substituent, but it's still attached to carbon number one of the benzene. And then once again, we don't have to say one ethyl benzene. In fact, we don't say one ethyl benzene. We just say ethyl benzene. One big word. Cool. So that's monosubstituted benzenes. It gets a little more complex with disubstituted benzene and even more substituted. So we're going to do some polysubstituted. We'll start off with disubstituted ones here. Uh, and if you're wondering where, where's the ortho meta para stuff, in case you've already seen that in your course, uh, that's coming. We're going to cover that in the next section here. So, but uh, we'll kind of use the numerical version here. And when we get to some benzenes with special names in the very next little section of this particular lesson, we'll start seeing those ortho meta para. So if you're wondering, where are those? They're coming. All right. So if we look here, when you've got two substituents uh, with exactly two, just like we saw with cyclohexanes, um, one of them gets to be attached to carbon number one of the benzene and the other one's going to get the other number. And it's a numerical tie either way. So like in this case, we have a bromine and an ethyl group, and it could be one and three or one and three. And since it's an absolute numerical tie, no matter which way you number it, the alphabet breaks the tie on a disubstituted. And then in this case, bromo comes before ethyl, and so we'll number him as number one, and then we number it clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever way gets to the second substituent faster. So in this case, we'll go counterclockwise. We got that guy right there. And so we go to name this. You name it in alphabetical order as well, which is still gonna follow the same order. So we're gonna have one bromo, three ethyl, benzene. All right, so same thing with the analogous one over here. So a little bit different numbering, but once again, you could have one and two or one and two. And with a numerical tie again, the alphabet breaks the tie and bromo is going to break it here again. The big thing I want to demonstrate here is that now we're going to count around clockwise. So there's no rule that says you have to, you know, count around uh, any direction. It's just whatever's going to give you your second substituent, the lower number. And so we'll go around clockwise this time. So, but still naming it, we'll go with the bromo first. And so one bromo. 2-ethyl, benzene. All right, so what if we've got like a tri-substitute or something more substitute than this? So this gets a little more complicated, but usually this doesn't come down to alphabet breaking the tie. And students often forget that there's not a, you know, a numerical equivalent uh, no matter how you number it. And so they often try to do the alphabet breaks the tie on something like this, just like with cyclohexanes. But keep in mind, that may not actually be the case. A lot of students want to make where the bromo is here, number one, because bromo comes before, before chloro and ethyl in the alphabet. But in this case, actually, it's going to be the ethyl that gets to be number one because we make him number one. Then we have another substituent at two and another substituent at four. And that would be one, two, and four. If you make the bromo number one, it would be one and then three and then four. It's numerically superior to that. So if you make the chlorine number one, it would be one, two, and five. And again, that's not better than one, two, four. So it's not a numerical tie. There is one superior way of numbering this. Uh, 
didn't have to use the alphabet to break the tie at all. We will still name these in alphabetical order though. And so in this case, we'll start off with bromo in the alphabet. So we'll say four bromo, and then chloro is next in the alphabet. So two chloro, one ethyl, and then benzene. Cool, and I just want to cover an example where we had to try substitute or something more than that, because again, a lot of students want to try and choose where number one is located on benzene using the alphabet in such a case, and it usually doesn't come down to that. All right, let's go through some more examples here with benzenes with special names. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at naming benzenes with some special names, and it turns out there are certain substituents when they're attached to a benzene, they get a special name. So first one here is a carboxylic acid. So if you were gonna name this with a very systematic IUPAC name, it would actually be called benzene carboxylic acid, and we'll learn carboxylic acid in the future. However, though, the IUPAC common name that is also accepted and much more commonly used is benzoic acid. Same thing here when you attach an aldehyde group to your benzene. Again, the IUPAC name for naming an aldehyde uh, attached to a ring like this would be benzene carbaldehyde. So, but again, almost nobody uses that name. You'll much more commonly see it as benzaldehyde. And that common name again is one accepted by IUPAC. All right, so when you've got uh, benzene with a hydroxyl group, we'll call that a phenol. So that is not just a phenol, this is phenol the name. Um, but in general, we call them phenols. We learned about those back in the alcohol chapter. And uh, methoxybenzene here, it's common name, much more commonly used as anisole for historical reasons. Uh, aminobenzene, again, much more commonly called aniline. Uh, this here is uh, styrene, vinyl benzene, and styrene of like polystyrene is actually a polymer uh, made using styrene as the monomer. Uh, here's toluene, methyl benzene, uh, much more commonly called toluene. Uh, this is a uh, 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 you put three nitro groups on there and you got trinitrotoluene, aka TNT. So there's his fame. And then if you've got dimethyl benzene, it turns out that's going to be called xylene. And uh, the two methyl groups can be oriented in three different ways and we'll kind of see the difference of what's going on there. All right, so those are your special ones. And when you name a benzene at, with one of these special names, then the substituent that it kind of identifies will be identified as being at carbon number one of the benzene. So, you know, if you name something as a phenol, so then uh, as the parent name anyways, then the number one on the benzene will be right where the OH is attached by default. That's kind of how that works. So let's take a look. So we're gonna start with some di-substituted benzene that have special names. Uh, and in this case, we'll see a little bit different. Instead of using the numbering system, which you can still use, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, we also have one other option. So in this case, notice there's no special name for the chlorine. That's just chlorobenzene if you have you know, a chlorine on a benzene. But there is a special name associated with the OH. And so most of the time, you'd more commonly see this named as a phenol rather than like hydroxybenzene. And so in this case, if we call it phenol though, then that automatically makes this carbon number one of the benzene. So, and then to get the lowest possible number, this would then be carbon number two where the chlorine is attached. And so we got a couple of different options here. We could call this two chloro phenol, or it turns out with disubstituted benzenes, when you have a special name, you have another option to identify where is that second substituent relative to the parent chain's functional group. And in this case, for the one, two relationship, we call that ortho. And so you could call this ortho chlorophenol as well. And sometimes we just shorten it to O chlorophenol, just like we did oxylene down here when the two methyl groups are in that one, two relationship. That's the first one. So we've also got here in this case, a one, three relationship. And then here, regardless of whether I go clockwise or counterclockwise on this one, it's gonna be a one, four relationship. And those have special names as well. But again, you can still use the numbers. There's nothing wrong with that. And so you could call this one three chlorophenol. So, but it turns out you can also call it meta-chlorophenol for this numeric relationship. And sometimes we'll just shorten this down to M, little little case M chlorophenol. So totally acceptable as well. Same thing on this last one here now with the 1-4 relationship. It turns out we call that para. So, but again, you can still use the numbers. This is four chlorophenol but you could also call it para chlorophenol or simply p chlorophenol for short. 
Cool, so for disubstituted benzenes, instead of the numbers, you'll actually much more commonly see ortho, meta, and para used. So, but these are also gonna be special terms when we talk about reactions in the next chapter. So, because it turns out that when you've got a, a reaction involving a benzene, at certain positions on the benzene might be activated or deactivated, and we usually identify with the ortho, uh, meta, and para relationships instead of like the two, three, or four relationships. Uh, you'll hardly ever see anybody identify it in such fashion. So, really important you understand uh, what ortho, meta, and para mean, and understand how they can be applied to nomenclature here with disubstitute benzenes when you've got one of these special benzenes involved. So, I want to take a look at a couple more examples of benzenes with special names. And, uh, in this first one here, we actually have two different groups that both have a special name associated with them. So methoxybenzene is also called anisol, and again hydroxybenzene is also called phenol. And so you actually get two different ways you can name this. So if we name it as a phenol, then automatically again that becomes carbon number one, which means where the methoxy group is located would be carbon number two. And so you could name this as 2-methoxy phenol, but we could have chosen to name the methoxy group as, as part of the major uh, special name, so and call it anisol, so that'd be carbon number one, and the hydroxy group would be a carbon number two, and so in this case, we'd now call it 2-hydroxy anisol. Cool, and both are totally acceptable. So, uh, you know, you commonly, if you look this up, you'll see both names associated with this lovely compound, both accepted by IUPAC. All right, so what if we go up here to a little more substitute, uh, substitute of benzene? And uh, in this case, we've got a bromo, a chloro, and a methoxy, and only the methoxy gets a special name. And so most commonly then, you'd see us choosing that to be carbon number one. We call this anisol again for methoxybenzene. And if we make him number one, because we're gonna call it an anisol, well then the lowest number I can get the next substituent I come across is if I number this clockwise and put the chlorine at two, and then keep going and put the bromine at five. So in this case, we've got bromochloroanisol, and we'll name uh, the bromo and the chlorine alphabetical order. So we'll start with that bromo. And so we've got five bromo, and then two chloro, and then anisol for the parent name. Cool. That's kind of how that works. And once again, you could try and go through this and not use anisol as the name and just have like methoxy and chloro and bromo and stuff like this. And that's where things get a little bit confusing and you're less commonly going to see that. So if you've got one of these special benzenes, you are way more likely to name your benzene as special benzene. Or if it's presented to you, you're way more likely to be given the name with one of these special names incorporated.